talk about them. So by focusing on giving restrictive gifts, as those types of gifts start to come in, would that significantly increase the administrative burden on the church leadership to ensure the gifts are used as the donor wanted? And the other question that came in is, in my church, all gifts are seen as unrestricted, and any donor who says, I want to fund this project or this ministry, we tell them their money will go to the general fund for all the needs, works for, of the church. Do you think yeah. that this is a mistake in limiting people who want to give? And so those are the those are yes. two questions that, that seem to address uh, what you're talking about. Yeah. So love those questions and they're really important. Uh, if you fundamentally want to understand how come churches don't get big gifts, that's the answer. They're not offering donors any opportunity to do good. They are not offering donors the opportunity for them, the donors, to become rich in visible, beautiful, good works. Uh, whereas the the uh, organizations like mine, we do offer those opportunities, right, to, to, uh, to donors. Uh, so that's one of the key distinctions. Now, let's take a look at some practical aspects, some, some scriptural aspects. Now, when we look at ways to do fundraising, we can start with scripture. We've got that passage in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. And the, and the reason I focus on that is that that actually is different. Now, we know that there are lots of passages that are written to the giver. This one is not. This is actually written to the fundraiser. This is Paul explaining to Timothy how you do, well, we would call it how you do major gifts fundraising, right? And so it is written to the fundraiser on how you encourage generosity in, in this way. Then when we look at, okay, that's the instructions. Can we see this in action? Absolutely. We've got Paul's uh, uh, donor appeal letter in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And what is Paul raising money for? a restricted gift. He is not raising money for general revenue to the church. He is raising money for a specific restricted gift project uh, that he is uh, he is sort of uh, trying to, uh, to champion. And then interestingly enough, there is a final example, which is we get Paul's donor acknowledgement letter in Philippians 1 and 4. So we actually get this wonderful three-part set of how fundraising is done uh, with the general, here is how you do it. Um, you're going to give donors the opportunity to accomplish something good, to do good works, to become themselves rich in beautiful, visible good works, a different word for good there. Uh, to, and to be generous and ready to share. Then we get his instructions in a restricted gift campaign in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And then we get his donor acknowledgement letter uh, as uh, the beginning and the end after the greeting and the conclusion in, in, in Philippians. And what we see is those things are all parallel, that when he is saying this is how you do fundraising, you, you want them to uh, feel like they have done good. Well, then when he done his, his donor acknowledgement letter, he specifically tells them the impact of their gift, how he was under great hardship and duress, and now he has great abundance. You know, if you make a gift to a ministry, you're used to getting back the acknowledgement letter with another request. Paul's acknowledgement letter says, we're all good here. Thanks so much. It, you know, it filled up everything. That's a pretty exciting kind of donor acknowledgement letter to, to, to get. So to begin with, um, it, we start with scripture. Now let me go to the data. Here is the fundamental reality. Big gifts come with instructions. Point blank. Big gifts come with instructions. Okay, whether that be estate gifts, where do the largest estate gifts go? They go to the most massive set of instructions that we have, which is called the Private Family Foundation. In fact, about 70% of all the charitable estate dollars in the country go to private family foundations. We're talking about pages and pages of specific instructions on how those gifts are going to be used. And we know that experimentally too. If you give people the opportunity to add instructions with their money, it will increase the size of their gift. You see, it's the idea that beyond the reason to make a gift, you need a reason to make a gift of a specific size. And the reason to make a gift of a specific size is that it's going to accomplish something specific, something visualizable. Now, 
let's talk about the practical side of that. If you're allowing donors or at least uh, those making high capacity donors that are that are wanting to make these kinds of gifts, if you're allowing them to put instructions with the money, how is that going to work? Well, one thing to keep in mind is this. If you have a donor who is putting instructions with their money for it to fund something that's already in your budget that is identical to unrestricted money from an accounting perspective. That is, you are already going to spend the money on that, and so now you're just spending the specific dollars on, uh, on uh, the, that particular project. So the first thing that you can do is to uh, simply take a budget and you can break it apart, uh, sort of uh, creating each item as being fungible. We've got item A and B and C and D and E and F, and these are all opportunities for you to, uh, to uh, fund different items. Well, that's a lot more exciting to give because notice if you allow me to fund something specific, what am I doing? I am making a gift that accomplishes something. In fact, it accomplishes work. And this work word Paul uses repeatedly when he's describing what the donors are doing. And so if we say – so let me put it this way. Uh, let's say, uh, Tim, that um, uh, that you were uh, – you mentioned you were interested. Maybe we have an outreach ministry uh, to the homeless. Uh, so what I might say is uh, – um, well, you know, Tim, these are all the great things that, that are happening uh, with our outreach to the homeless. Uh, now, if you were to fund that uh, for uh, a month of operations, uh, that would cost, uh, let's say, uh, $2,000. Now, you could fund a whole year. Uh, for uh, about $25,000, uh, or if you'd like to set up a permanent endowed fund to make sure that we could always have this covered, uh, that would be about $1 million uh, or a half a million dollars in that case. My math is a little bit off. Uh, so the idea is that you're looking at this work. This is the good work, and here's how you can pay for this specific visualizable work. Uh, and so we do something that churches are really bad at which is we put the big gift on the menu. In other words, instead of just saying, yeah, we would love to have your gift for this uh, minis you know, X ministry. I've just called it a homeless ministry, right? We have now broken it down to say you can cover the cost of this ministry for one week or for one month for this dollar amount. Now I am buying work. That's what the language says, the idea that the – I mean, and people with wealth are used to buying work, right? They understand that idea of, of buying mm -hmm. work. Now, how do we make this happen? Does it mean that, yes, we need to make sure that, okay, those dollars are going to that? It does create administrative hassle. So the trade-off is this. We have more administrative hassle to get a much better donor experience and – to have an order of magnitude larger gifts. Now, from a secular organization, we do it to get the order of magnitude larger gifts. From a spiritual perspective, we do it because the most important thing is the donor's experience. Is this a joyful giving experience? Yeah, I can imagine. I know that I have bought running that ministry for, uh, for you know 30 days or for a year or permanently, uh, you know, whatever the case might be in that case. That is a wonderful, joyful experience, something where I can see the impact, and I'm, I'm going to come back and, and do it again. Sometimes these conflicts aren't as strong as they need to be, uh, or as you might think they are, uh, between the restricted and unrestricted, because you've got to understand that from an internal perspective, we care about accounting world. We care about finance world, right? And so this number needs to move over here and all of that. But from a fundraising perspective, we care more about story world, right? And so the idea is I want to create that visualizable experience. And you and I know that if you're doing this ministry anyway, that somebody who restricts their gifts to fund this specific industry, this specific ministry, it's the same as unrestricted giving because we just move other stuff around. That's the accounting reality. But we don't have to have that conflict because the story reality of it is that my dollars did this specific thing, and that is a 
much more joyful giving experience and makes it much more attractive uh, to the donors. Um, so that's a long way of saying that this is really kind of the crux of the issue, and it is fundamentally why the big gifts go elsewhere. But you don't have to change your leadership structure. You don't have to change uh, uh, you know, how your decisions are made to have that opportunity to make restricted gifts. And it's really important that if someone says, hey, I want to fund this ministry, um, that number one, they only get to control their gift, right? So there's none of this, you all need to start new ministry X and here's 10%. I like, know that's not, that's not how that works, right? Um, so, so you do obviously have to put restrictions on that, making sure that every gift is beneficial to the church and the church's mission. 